was the biggest, loudest unstart, and I was in the worst possible point you could be. The airplane pitched up, and I went full forward stick, trimming nose down, and it still went up, and then it stopped, and then it kind of stayed there for a little bit, and then it started coming down. And uh, I, I was re reminded of Bill Weaver. Bill Weaver was a Lockheed test pilot in the early days, and he lost an airplane finding out what the AFCG limit was. He was in a 45 degree bank turn at Mach 3.3 probably and had an unstart and the airplane pitched up and just kept on pitching up and he went to full forward stick. So that's the kind of limit you're looking at is that you are flying the thing at, at the flight manual limit and an airplane's limit. That's a lot to unravel in that. Uh, can you start for, the, for those who have no idea what it is by explaining what a, an unstart is? Yes, first a started inlet is this was well known, I say, by the ancients a long time ago, how supersonic shock waves react. Okay? When you hit Mach 1, the airplane hits a bow wave like this. And why, why the speed of sound is, is important is because speed of sound is the speed at which information can be propagated in the air. So if you take a fan and go like that, the air currents move. Well, each individual air molecule gets the information at the speed of sound, and no, no, no greater than that. So when you hit the speed of sound, what you have is a buildup of air molecules. They're not supposed to be there. They're supposed to be spread out, but you're going so fast that you've, you've bunched them up. And now you punch through it, you punch through it with the, with the speed, and then this, this shock wave starts bending back to, to a cone. And you can see uh, there's lots of uh, diagrams in the internet to show you that. But, then that's called the mock cone. And the mock cone then starts to envelop the airplane. If you really want to know how fast the airplane can go and stay maneuverable, then you can uh, see the angle between the nose and the tip of the, of the wing. That angle kind of tells you that you, you go faster than that angle, then you're going to be, you're going to have buffet on your, on your ailerons or on your elevons, and that may not be a good, good thing to do. So that's one, one way. So as you, and then, as you punch through, then you have shock waves build up. Well, the engine wants as much pressure. I'm talking in terms of the engine being a, a living thing. The engine to, to perform properly must have the optimum, or it must have as much pressure as you can get so that the compressor can take that and compress it more and turn it into thrust. If you, if you go from a, okay, now when you have supersonic flow, you can either set up a series of oblique shocks, which gradually decrease the pressure pressure coming in on the on the uh, on the free stream side of the uh, of the flow or you could have a normal shock and all supersonic flow has to terminate in a perpendicular normal shock to the flow but the pressure recovery on the other side of the normal shock is a function of one over the Mach number what that means is that the optimum recovery would be Mach 1.1 or so normal shock and then you have one divided by 1.1 which is pretty close to one you have that much recovery. So at Mach 3, then that, uh, if you just went from Mach 3 to a normal shock to the compressor, then that the, uh, the function would be uh, multiplied by one third. So you'd lose one third of your pressure or more. So the idea is to set up a series of oblique shocks that are predictable. And you do that by changing the position from the, from the uh, first thing that the air sees, which is the tip of the spike, which is very sharp, and the inlet. And then inside the inlet, as you as you accelerate, you want to change the capture area, moving the, the spike back and increase the capture area. Then according to the geometric configuration of the inlet and the geometric shape of the spike, these sets of oblique shocks are set up so that you will have at the throat, and the throat is the the minimum part of the flow between the outside and the compressor, that is the place where the normal shock is. So if everything's working well, you have slowed the air down scientifically, methodically, and have recovered all of the pressure that you can have in the inlet. Now, I said earlier that the outside air pressure is about one quarter of one PSI. On the ground, it's at sea level, it's 15.8 or so PSI. So it's a big difference. By going at Mach 3 and using this, this step-down method, if the inlet is working right, the pressure at the presser face is about 15 to 16 PSI. So pressure-wise, the engine thinks it's at sea level, but it's at 80,000 feet. Okay, now an unstart is the violent expulsion of the normal shock from inside the inlet to outside the airplane. So it expels it forwards. Yes, 
yeah, it goes whoom, wham. And so I say violent e- e- expulsion because it happens immediately. And uh, sometimes there's no warning for it. Now, what would cause it? Well, for one thing, angle, uh, angle of uh, side slip. I demonstrated that in Mach 3.2. Now, the airplane is supposed to, the spike is supposed to compensate for a uh, side slip and for angle of attack because they both would, would cause this, which would bias the spike slightly forward and make it a little bit more safe. This is this is how it works. But I can tell you at Mach 3.2, that's not enough. Don't don't go don't do a full rudder side slip. And there's no reason for do that anyway. It was just a test, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so the violent expulsion. So what you have to do is for that particular inlet is you have to make it in a safe configuration. The safe configuration is to open the forward bypass doors and keep the spike full forward. Well, this gives you an increased drag, and it's uh, on the first supersonic flight, the instructor always demonstrated this. You know, here we are going along and you could hit what they call the restart switch and that would put you in the in this safe configuration. But it would it would, it would, it would brrr, you feel like this, the drag, considerable drag on the airplane. There's nothing to keep you from taking the throttle and, and going full then to stop the deceleration. But what are you doing? You're flying around with your uh, throttle in full afterburner and what, what's your fuel doing? <coughs> going down. So you want to get that thing uh, you want to get that thing fixed as, as soon as possible. The emergency procedure is, first of all, the Air Force never cared for making an emergency, uh, part of the emergency procedure, the uh, immediate action, something to do with flying the airplane, because we're all supposed to know how to fly the airplane. On this one, is different. It was alpha within limits, and alpha within limits means, we all know, expect a pitch up, check your alpha. If you don't see the nose coming up, check your alpha anyway, because it might be. And if it does come up, then be prepared to go a full forward stick and trim down. The trim actually would increase your nose down authority from the, the uh, yellow bonds. So that was the thing that you could do. That, that's what I did, and it, it worked. The recovery procedure is to first uh, bring back the uh, spike. You have a manual uh, hot or a p- potentiometer that you can put the spike back to where it should be, noting your Mach number and noting the position. And the spike, incidentally, was in Mach number. It was not by inches. We don't care what inches is. I want to know where that thing should be because the spike was was uh, strictly on a mock schedule, the position, spike position. So if I'm at 2.8, now I put that thing at 2.8 and it biased it a little bit. So you hit, and then you take the forward bypass door and close it down. That's called a manual inlet if you've done it manually. What you can do is let it go through its normal recycle and just see what happens. And uh, most of the time, it, it came back and restarted just fine. So it, it would do that automatically for you one time. And then if it didn't work that time, you do it, do it yourself. You, you said it was violent, but violent it was. So you would bang your head against the, the canopy. And, and, well, and it was completely I, unexpected, right? You, you, oh, unexpected, yes. There were a few times when if it rumbled or something like that, it, it might happen. There was one airplane, I was 958, I think, that had a, had a habit of doing that rumble and then start. Yeah, I think it was 958. We called them by number. <laughs> we knew those airplanes. <laughs> 956 was a trainer and it was it was always in good shape. How long did it take to get the engine back doing what it was supposed to do? How long, or the shockwave rather, doing what it was supposed to, what you wanted it to do? Uh, you know, would it, would it... Yeah, f- four seconds. Okay, so, so it didn't impact op- operationally. So you could be in the middle of a mission and, and it wasn't the end of the world. But now this is another caveat is you better know what you're doing, see? Because if you get the spike back first and before the, uh, the, the that, that, well, the other thing is what makes flying at high altitude critical is that your CG and your EGT, your exhaust gas temperature, is very sensitive at high altitude. So you, uh, you have an unstarted inlet, you have decreased the flow of air into your compressor. Well, what does that do? That increases your EGT. The uh, dash one, the flight manual said you have three seconds to get that engine, to get that EGT back if it goes above 950, I think. We had a crew that uh, had an end start and it was, uh, they were at high mock and uh, they burned up an engine in three seconds. They, they were not uh, to blame for it, but it just, it was, they were at high mock and high altitude and the, uh, they tried. Oh, I know their D-rich system failed. That was the other thing. We had a, a D-rich system that if the EGT got above a certain limit, it was uh, maybe 30, degree, 30 degrees higher than the max limit, then the fuel control would actually take fuel away from the engine and cause a degradation in the engine. Just like taking your 
throttle back below afterburner. Only it was better than that because you really didn't have, I'm getting into the weeds here. <laughs> the fuel control wouldn't let you do that, but the, the, the D-Rich would do that. And uh, that, that would that would keep you out of trouble. But on his particular thing, he had this unstart at high altitude. The EGT went up, the D-Rich system didn't work. And, you know, say, hey, what's going on? Engine gone. No, it, it was burning. Three seconds. Oh, yeah. Well, it, may, it might have taken a while to really burn it, but it was, by the time they got on the ground, it, it, it was, that was, it was mm -hmm. garbage. If you enjoyed this clip and want more, you can go to 10 hit subscribe, and get early ad-free access to all my content. Appreciate your support.